call it the fortnight of frenzy, even by Trump standards. The last two weeks have been turbulent both domestically and globally. So let's start. Let's just go there with the conspiracy. So the president retweets this guy who implied that Jeffrey Epstein didn't die by suicide, but was actually killed by the Clintons. He also retweets a claim from a random Twitter account that the FBI ignored investigating the Parkland shooter and the convicted sex abuse uh, abuser Larry Nassar because they too were busy investigating Trump. In the aftermath of the mass shootings in El Paso and Dayton, the president insulted the mayors of both of those cities. And then there was this photo with the little baby who was orphaned in those El Paso attacks, uh, a thumbs up and a grin. That didn't go over well. Neither did the Mississippi ice raids, which became a new kind of family separation for this administration and left kids alone without their parents. But acting citizenship and immigration services director Ken Cuccinelli warned more are coming. Their enforcement efforts are up, and I think you can expect to see more of that as part of the message of this administration. We're going to enforce the law. And of course, it was Cuccinelli who then tried to take a red pin to the Statue of Liberty poem. Would you also agree that Emma Lazarus's words etched on the Statue of Liberty, give me your tired, your poor, are also part of the American ethos? Uh, they certainly are. Give me your tired and your poor who can stand on their own two feet and who will not become a public charge. Well, of course, that poem was referring back to people coming from Europe where they had class-based societies where people were considered wretched if they weren't in the right class. And even those who have been loyal to this president not only turned on him, but suggested he's not all there. This guy, I was loyal to him because that is the nature of my background. That is the nature of my neighborhood. And I was trying to do everything I could to stay loyal to him, but he's going crazier and crazier. It's not any calmer on the global stage. The president tiptoed around the pro-democracy revolt unfolding in Hong Kong and largely ignored a series of missile launches by North Korea. In fact, he praised Kim Jong-un and criticized the joint U.S. and South Korean military drills as, quote, ridiculous. He also took to Twitter to urge Israeli leaders to block two U.S. congresswomen from visiting. And that is exactly what Israel did. Uh, the economy, the Dow, which he always takes credit for when it's up, dropped 800 points after the bond market warned of a recession. Uh, of course, he blamed everyone from the Fed chair to the media. And you know the guy he mocked at his rally for being overweight? That guy's got a serious weight problem. Go home, start exercising. Turns out the president called him today, but he did not apologize. And to cap it all off, the president inquired about purchasing Greenland, like the country. Well, buying Greenland might be strategically awesome. Greenland currently belongs to Denmark. And Denmark's foreign minister says, quote, if Trump is truly contemplating this, then this is the final proof that he has gone mad. So you're saying there's a chance Greenland's for sale? Folks, that was two weeks. Two weeks. Let me bring in Michael Smirconish. He is host of CNN Smirconish. And Michael, beyond all the, the chaos here, that the president has always considered the economy his fail-safe issue. But with that potentially in jeopardy, and reportedly this administration doesn't have a plan if there is a recession, can he still run on the economy? You know, I just listened and paid attention to the highlight reel. And to hear what's transpired in the last week or two, you'd say that's a real S show, right? <laughs> uh, but... <laughs> It didn't stop anybody who showed up last night in New Hampshire. It, it did not keep away the record crowd that showed up in Manchester last night to, to hear their guy. So what do I interpret from that? Nothing that you've articulated will dissuade those who supported him from doing so again, with the exception, though, Brooke, to your question of the economy. He, mm -hmm. he may be able to shoot somebody on Fifth Avenue, but the polling data and the focus group analysis suggests that this really is his Achilles heel. He's never been above 50% as president in terms of his approval rating, but he's been evaluated in the best of economic conditions and only comes in in the mid 40s. So bottom line, uh, all of the other things um, are frankly a harumph in the age of Trump. The economy, big stuff. 
such a valid point. People showed up for him, and then if and when he does feel cornered by whatever the issue may be, right, the president has shown he knows how to turn his voters against his political rival, rivals. Or you think of, you know, what he was able to do with, with Robert Mueller, the special counsel. But, but the economy, Michael, I would argue, is not something that he could weaponize, right? I mean, at the end of the day, everyone has a wallet. Everyone's worrying about, you know, their, their, their financial business. And, and it's that feeling of security or lack thereof that they would bring to the ballot box next November. I think what you're saying is, and I agree with it, he can't lay this off on somebody else. And, That's and what probably I'm the reason, yeah, the reason that he can't lay it off on somebody else is because for the last two years, he's been taking full credit for it. I mean, you can't, you can't point at Strzok and Page or Hillary Clinton or, you know, Barack Obama or Jim Comey. I could sit here and I could give you the laundry list of the usual suspects, but mm -hmm. you can't blame any of them if the economy takes a turn. And, and I'm just not equipped to know if there's some kind of a blip on the radar screen right now or if this is the beginning of a downturn. I hope it's not the beginning of a downturn. Of course, of course. We all hope that. We all hope that.